for November 29th, uh, 2016. We'll start the meeting with Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, it's very refreshing to see we're getting rain, and very nice. Uh, we're going to start the hearing on tax uh, rate classification. Uh, Mr. Swanson from the Assessor's Office, sir. Uh, this is something we do every year. I believe you've got a motion. We're going to recommend, as we do every year, that... Uh, we only have a single tax rate for all various classifications of property. The reason for that is that uh, Southampton is basically a bedroom community. About 94% of our assessed valuation is residential. Uh, about 4.5% uh, is commercial and industrial. And if that four and a half percent were to be provide, you know, given a different tax rate, uh, frankly, uh, it wouldn't make any substantive difference to the residential taxpayers. So for that reason, oh, the other one percent or one and a half percent is personal property. If you're trying to add up the percentages, <clears throat> for that reason, we recommend that. Uh, as we do every year, that the board take a uh, make a motion to uh, adopt a factor of 1.0 for all classes of property. And I'll certainly answer any questions that I'm able to answer if the board has any. If I can't answer them, we'll ask Mike. Any questions? So how will this affect the tax rate? What will we end up being? Thank you, Brian. What will the tax rate be per thousand? In order to set the tax rate, we, we've already been certified as to the total uh, amount of assessed valuation that we have to tax, which is that 682 and change figure. 682 million, uh, 674, 713. Uh, I can't specifically tell you what the tax rate will be because we don't have the actual budget. We don't have the exact amount of money that we're seeking to raise at this point. Mike has uh, talked with the town accountant and uh, Vicki basically figures that it'd be about a 1% increase in the tax rate, bringing it up. <coughs> to $16 and uh, 31 cents, I believe, Mike? That's correct. Okay. That's the good news. The bad news is this was a reval year and uh, some people's properties have gone up in value. Any questions? I hear a motion. I'll make the motion. Uh, I make a motion to adopt a single tax rate factor of 1% for all classes of property. 1.0. 1.0%. No percent. It's just a factor of 1.0. Okay, 0. factor of 1.0. Yep. Yeah. second? I'll second that. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. <coughs> We have a scheduled hearing on the cable contract for 6.30, so obviously it's not even close to 6.30. Open time for public? Anyone? <coughs> Robert Floyd, 15 East Street, uh, town moderator. I, I met with uh, our new town administrator today. We had a great meeting. There was no rudeness. The man is comfortable in his own skin. Very straightforward. Um, thrilled to be working with him. Thank you, Bob. Anyone else? Good evening, folks. I'm Barbara LaFlam, 20 Cook Road, Southampton. I've taken over the 
Thanksgiving holiday an opportunity to print out the uh, governmental study um, evaluation of the structure and operations of Southampton town government. There's some very interesting suggestions in that report. I would like to request that the select board go very slowly in adopting the suggestions put forward in the home rule. This uh, seems to be written with a preconceived determination that the conclusion would include home rule. And in fact, it says so on page three. I know that the study was done with a lot of input from department heads and board members and so forth. However, there seems to be one group of people that are not being consulted before this Home Rule Charter is adopted. You've been asked to adopt it and put it forward. However, the voters have not been asked for their input. And I think it's a mistake to put so much emphasis and so much authority in a town administrator. They tend to come to Southampton and they stay two or three years and then another job opportunity comes along and they move on. Nobody knows the people of Southampton like the voters of Southampton. There are neighbors, there are people down the street, there are people from across town, and the voters, I think, have very good judgment. To, and I think you have seen it. There seemed to be a blind eye. The voters have been asked before, did they want to uh, have someone else appoint the town clerk? That's been defeated by the voters at least twice. The voters were asked, do they want to uh, have the town accountant appointed, the, the treasurer, no, the treasurer collector. And I think the voters rejected that as well. So I would like to ask, and this is a very simple way for the select board and others to get input from the voters, and that's a simple questionnaire. I can remember back in 2000, the year 2000, there was a visioning workshop, and in with the census, which is mailed to every household, there was a two-page questionnaire. Didn't have to sign it. You could put down whatever you wanted as a voter. You could drop it in the slot. You could put it in an um, envelope and mail it back. The overwhelming response to that, one questionnaire, two pages, simple questions, 1,054 people responded, written response. That's a lot of people. That will give you a much better indicator of how people actually feel. You can ask them about finances. You can ask them about appointments. You can ask them whatever you want. Why did the uh, voters not support the safety complex? Was it the location? Was it the dollar amount? Is there some other reason? Those are the kinds of questions that you could ask, and people, because it's anonymous, will respond. So that's my, that's my little blurb for tonight. But I really would like you to think carefully and provide opportunity for people to sit down, take this in, discuss it with others before you say, well, this is the direction we need to go because this is what our paid consultants said to do. They're not always right. Thank you. Barbara? First, thank you. You're welcome. Two, you are being heard. And three, there's nothing on this board's agenda into January about even reviewing this until we get past the holidays. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate it.
Open time still open. Going once. It's gone. Going to move right into uh, reports. Uh, let's do the select board updates liaisons. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Could I uh, make the uh, offer the appointment? We have one appointment. Sure. Uh, because some individuals are, are here to. Oh, I did not know that. That's my. Filling out the term of Candace McDougal on the Board of Library Trustees, the recommendation is for Norman Smith, who is a former trustee and comes with the recommendation of the board. May I hear a motion? Make a motion. May I a second? A second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 I, I know it's complicated. It took, a, it took us a minute. No, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> Thank you, Bob, for slowing me down because I did not know why they were here. Yeah, that's fine. <clears throat> Would you like to get to the podium and introduce yourself as to? Oh, um, <laughs> I'm Convy Stahl, and I'm the chair of the, uh, the Southampton Edwards Library trustee. And so Mr. Smith has agreed to fulfill to um, you know, be appointed to serve out Candace's um, um, term, which will end next spring, and then um, I don't. Hopefully, he may decide to run, or maybe there'll be others, but that will help to fill that vacancy until then. So we appreciate that very much. So, very good. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. <clears throat> Am I clear, Bob? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Select board uh, liaison updates. Jim, anything? I have nothing new. No. All right. Uh, Town <coughs> Administrator's Report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just to some updates. Uh, as the board is well aware, there was a very important meeting recently uh, regarding a second shift uh, for the ALS ambulance service. Uh, I've been requested to prepare a report and that is underway. I did meet uh, for quite some time uh, with the town accountant to talk about finances. I think that's really the key that we're looking for here for the next fiscal year to be able to find the right financing so that uh, the town can continue to make progress towards uh, full ALS uh, ambulance service. Um, also, uh, I've had a number of just introductory meetings. I just met uh, today with the chair of the Greenway Committee. Uh, he is requesting an executive uh, session uh, with the Board of uh, Selectmen to discuss negotiations with uh, the Pioneer Valley Railroad. Um, and I said it probably would, we have, probably have a full agenda for December 6th, but <clears throat> if it's the Board's wish, uh, we could put it on for December the 20th. Sure. Sounds good with me. Okay, you guys? Yeah. Okay. 20th. <clears throat> not here. You're not here? Oh, wait a minute. I can't sit in on that meeting. Uh, the next meeting would be uh, in January. Yeah, I don't want to I don't want to drag them that, that far. That, that project. So we, well, going. we can go to the 6th then. I think they only have one or two things on executive session for the 6th, right? We have one, two, three. But they should move right along. Okay. Yeah, it should be pretty quick, I think. Yeah, so yeah Jim was there this afternoon, and there's there's good news. So. Well, that's uh, all. Awesome. <laughs> <they, they laughs> well, I'm glad to hear when you show up. There's good news. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's do the sixth then. So I'll uh, put it on for the sixth. All right. Uh, I think we have the whole issue uh, squared away now with uh, the uh, SEPTA barn. Uh, repairs Zipta. and so Zipta. Zipta barn. Zipta. I said Zipta. <coughs> Zipta. Yeah. Correct. Okay. I was over to take a look at it. I like the new doors. Uh, obviously, there's a roof issue mm -hmm. that needs to be addressed. But uh, it's a nice uh, structure for the town. We did have a discussion about whether it's the best thing to have the conservation commission in charge of that, or whether it should be transferred to the control of another town uh, committee or, or board. So I think that's worth considering. I thought we were going to look into the deeds to see where it was deeded to. Are we going to look 
that was that, that was yeah. what I thought conservation was going to do was check their deeds. Right. We needed to see where it was going. What yeah. what board has control? Robert has a have an input. Robert Floyd, 15 East Street. The Conservation Commission met in 2006-2007, a joint meeting with the Historical Commission, and it was agreed that Plan A for the Zip the Barn would be to turn it over into a farm museum. And there were farmers that were willing to donate their historic farm machinery, and uh, there was a change of management. Uh, back when, um, and nothing was done on it, but uh, I'm sure it's in their minutes and in their records. I, I, I understand that, but what we're looking at is, is there are deed restrictions. If there are no deed restrictions, then we can laterally move it over to another commission or committee to oversee it. Yeah, I haven't looked at the deed in a while, so I don't know. That, yeah. That's yeah. the question. Okay. Yeah. So we'll have to see if that's uh, checked out. I mean, the argument that was made was that the, core mission of the Conservation Commission is open space right. and that they don't have experience in managing uh -huh. buildings. And so right. they thought it might be appropriate to be under the care of another, another uh, municipal historic body. becomes eligible for certain grants and stuff right. for historic buildings yeah. and that's a historic building. So. Where did the town take that over? Uh, Bob, what was that, 20 years ago we took that over? Uh, 17 years, yes, yeah. approximately, and then they, they built the foundation um, subsequently, and <coughs> this is the second time, and a roof, a little patch on the roof, and the doors, and Ed Lee Jr. was the one yeah. who would mow uh, for years, but yeah, it was around 20 years ago. Hmm. You know, I'm just saying. Okay. Okay, I met with the chair of the school committee about uh, financing issues for their technology needs. I put the number there on the report is what they're in need of in order to purchase uh, laptop computers uh, for students. So that's a challenge, obviously. Is that all in one year or was that? Uh, actually, we up? discussed maybe two years, okay. maybe two years. So divide that by two per year. That's not 180. That's per a total year. over two years. It'd be total over two years. Okay. Yes. So uh, they make a very strong case, though, that this technology is very much needed in the public schools. Um, tonight you're going to hear from Don Jacobs with his classification compensation report. I've met several times with him about this. Um, also, importantly, tomorrow we're going to work with department heads to update the town's list of vehicles for insurance purposes. <clears throat> Apparently, uh, <clears throat> in the past at least, uh, they found that some vehicles that the town had turned in were still being insured and so forth. So we want to make sure that, <clears throat> that the list is accurate and up to date for insurance purposes. The Conservation Commission voted on November 21st to recommend that the select board waive the right to purchase lots A through E on Woodmar Lane. This is a 61A project. and. Uh, so they're requesting, we're requesting that you, you waive your right to acquire that, that property since <clears throat> it's uh, not going to be 61A protected any longer. That needs to get on the agenda for next meeting. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and also here's a message that we received on the 22nd from the Commissioner of Revenue. Uh, the DOR has determined that the locally assessed values of real and personal property in Southampton represent full and fair cash valuation as of January 1, 2006 uh, for fiscal year 2007. So we are, our certification has been approved by the Department of Revenue. Good. Good. <clears throat> we also, as you know, got numbers in, tentative numbers in uh, for free cash and for new growth, which are encouraging today. Um, report that next time. Um, now, uh, had a discussion with the town clerk about uh, records access officer. As I mentioned to you earlier today, uh, clerk, uh, and as we discussed a bit with town council, <coughs> uh, the law seems to contemplate that the town clerk be <coughs> the records uh, access officer and that the town administrator be an adjunct, in effect, 
uh, job is to see to it that we comply, but not be the record keeper, <clears throat> and not to maintain that information that's going to be required by the new law. <clears throat> so for your consideration, uh, town clerk would like to be appointed to the position. So. <laughs> And you know, I, I think there's logic to it. Very good. Um, yeah. I, think, I think there's logic to it. So, make a motion. To I'll make the motion. To to the, uh, Does that have to be the on the agenda? Huh? Does that have to be on the agenda to vote on this, or can we just? Okay. I don't think so. It's we already voted on it, so I have to rescind the motion that we made to have the town administrator be the keeper. The new motion would be to have the town clerk be the keeper. Access I don't look at it as a financial, so it's just sort of. It could be. It's a lot of work. <laughs> she jumps it's up a and big... volunteered. Yeah. Oh, I have no problem with putting her on it. I just want to do it properly. You know, I think the right role, rightful role of town administrator is to be informed whenever there's a request and to see to it that, there's, that the town departments comply. Uh, as far as the bureaucratic side of that, uh, I think clerks can do a, probably a better job of that. So, yeah, I don't know. I would like to see it on the agenda. <coughs> just throw it a line item next month, next uh, yeah, next right. month, December six. Right. I mean, just for it's there, we can <coughs> vote on it, and we'll have a full board, and maybe. Maybe. No. Okay, December six. It is. Okay, I'll quickly review upcoming uh, sessions and meetings. Uh, department head meetings tomorrow. Meeting tomorrow. Um, I will review. Uh, the uh, presentation that was it's going to be given to us tonight on classification and compensation and also we'll dig into vehicle insurance uh, the mass Western Mass Legislative Summit uh, on Saturday December 3rd uh, I'll be attending that um, the financial group meeting uh, is scheduled for December the 6th uh, the building subcommittee will meet on the 14th and um, the board, I assume tonight, will decide the date for the special town meeting. I would appreciate if we could set a firm date for submission of articles so that uh, there will be adequate time to get the articles together, to see that they're in proper form, get them reviewed by town council, and make sure that uh, they're letter perfect. Um, Does the board want to take this out of order? Well, yeah, that's on the agenda. I'd be glad to. Yeah. All right. I'm thinking the 24th of January. Why are you thinking that? Because of the fact that our next meeting is the 20th and right. it gives them 30 days to take and post and everything. <coughs> December 20th would be the day all the articles have to be on a warrant. Plus, it'll give the uh, planning board time to get the solar bylaw straightened out with the public hearing yeah. and get that in the same uh, schedule. So I think that would be great, the 24th. If we push it back to the 10th or the 17th, then we're in a panic trying to get things done in December. And Bob's just dying to get up to the podium again. <laughs> you know, for a town moderator. <laughs> Robert Floyd, 15 E Street. The special needs to be posted 14 days before the meeting versus the annual only seven. So it would need to be posted on January 10th. So that really reduces the and time frame. Christmas and New Year's and all yeah, the rest Yeah, I vote of for that. the 24th. Yeah. Okay. You voted too. <laughs> the only time I can vote. <laughs> so your motion for the 24th? So move. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Done. 24th, Bob. Okay, and so uh, our deadline for articles, and we'll bring this before the select board on the 20th yeah, so of December? Select, yeah, so we want to have these articles so you have some time to tweak them right. December 12th, 15th, something like that. Um, well, they'll be coming in. I, I will I'll update as, as they come in, but if, if we set the 15th as the firm deadline, but, that'll work. Yep, okay. Okay. Um, I did uh, speak with uh, Mr. Moskal. The uh, police uh, union have, has not yet voted. 
but they, they came and he picked up copies of the latest MOU and I would expect a vote uh, relatively soon. And the last item there we discussed uh, earlier today, um, the open meeting uh, complaint. So That's going to have to go into executive session exec at the next session. meeting, right. December 6th. Right. Uh, that's the report, Mr. Chair. Very good. Am I being too casual? Uh, Virginia A. Hart. Uh, in this case, I'm representing the school committee. I just want to make the point that these computers were not necessarily the idea of the school committee or the school, per se. The state, in its wisdom, is now going to test all students on computers. Yeah, for the MCAT. Yeah, well, whatever it is, it's not going to be the MCAS as we know it, know it. But they are all going to have to be done on computers at the same time for a grade. Therein lies the problem. You can't just bring them in. I guess that's the plan to try to get through the next bunch of them. But the students really need a chance to work on these before they ca they test and well what can we say when the state says this is what you'll do <laughs> the school department's looking for a hundred eighty thousand dollars yeah to buy these computers over the course of two years yeah they're going to need to go to the capital committee and present this to the capital committee yeah. and right now i don't know when the capital committee is going to meet but if we can meet before December 15th and get approval on some of these capital projects, then that funding for some of these laptops, I don't see it funding everything, but for oh, some no. of them would be in the end of January. Yeah, we are aware of that. And we do have a school committee meeting tomorrow night. They're well aware of this. And I knew that Aaron was going to be talking with, um, you know, trying to get through this. But this is not just something that the teachers or the school or the school committee said, wouldn't this be a nice idea? No one's... <laughs> no, no. I, I, I just want everyone to be clear on that. No. Not that, you know... It's... We, we, we deal with this on a data basis uh, in town. Things yeah. come up that we have to do that we didn't foresee. Oh, yeah. And if, if you think just the town by the school. In Virginia, I missed it. Um, when, the, when are they planning on implementing this? Uh, the testing, whenever they're doing in the spring, um, MCAS test is being tweaked um, with the other test, and but they have decided that all testing eventually has to be done on computers. And uh, what can I say? This school year, or is it um, in the following? Well, hopefully we'll be able to. They'll be able to possibly do some this year. I don't okay. know exactly the timetable, but certainly, and and it was sprung on the schools. It wasn't <laughs> like something they knew long ago. Yeah. It just was. You, you would think that once yeah. they. Thank you. <laughs> that's not my area. Yeah. Any other boards, departments with reports? Good evening. Matt Christie, Water Commission. Wanted to give you guys an update of where we're at. Special town meeting. We're probably going to be putting forth uh, up to three articles on our behalf, on the town's behalf, on the water department's behalf. The first one being um, to fund Safe Roots to School, the water portion of that project that we were able to negotiate with the state. Uh, recall that they were looking for $200,000 or so, and now we're down to about $90,000 to um, improve a section of our main in that area that is extremely problematic for us. So that's one article. That's from between Pomeroy Meadow Road and Park Place. 
Pardon? And Park Place. And Park Place, yeah. Right. Um, the second article is related to our uh, master plan. And let me talk about that real quick. We've finalized our master plan. It's a final draft. We're going to open it up to the public for, for comments if they have any. It's pretty technical, but again, we think it's the right thing to do to open it up to the public. Um, we'll be doing that at our next meeting, which I believe is in a couple weeks. Um, that, artic that article, the second article, is related to a uh, parcel that we would like to acquire or an easement we'd like to acquire from a, a private party to build a uh, pump station that we're going to have a permanent interconnection with the city of East Hampton with. And that will be a, an emergency backup supply for our town. Right now we have an informal connection with them. It's not metered and it's not really... Um, it's not really a, a, a good practice that we've been doing, so we're going to formalize that and put up a try to put up a building with a pump station that'll be able to feed the entire town. It's on Route 10. Excuse me. Route 10. Yeah, in the in the Route 10 Coleman Road area. Yeah. Um, so we'll we'll have an article. We hope we'll be done with our negotiations by then to acquire an easement or a parcel in that area. And the third item is related to. One moment. Bonding. So part of our master plan, we identified a one to five year capital plan, five to 10 year capital plan, and then beyond 10. Um, we're looking to go out to uh, fund some of our projects in the five year plan and issue bonds on that. We've been working with Donna and Vicki to sort of set that process in motion be a, a new approach on? Um, what we've what we've discovered that it'll be uh, in our the town's best interest the water department's best interest to not only go out for, for new money but sort of refinance the existing bonds that are out there so it'll be a the goal is to uh, save the town save the, the ratepayers some money and in this all of this program is in line with the water rate restructuring that we did earlier in the year so it sort of completes the package and sets us on a on a long-term path towards a better water system. So those are the three uh, few major updates that we have. Um, we'll just keep the board informed as we go along. You'll see some articles hopefully in the next couple weeks. Any questions? No. Any discussions with Westfield? And tying into their system? Well, they're having or, problems right now. Yeah, I know. I saw the mayor today. Yeah. That's, they were one of the options. Um, you know, we're surrounded by three cities, so. I know. We have the best relationship with East Hampton right now. And uh, I forget if Westfield fluoridates or not. I know Holyoke fluoridates, and that creates an issue where the Holyoke South, Florida, Florida Southampton would have to vote to accept. Westfield does. I don't remember them doing it. Okay. We've had discussions with them before, and it wasn't, we really didn't feel like we were getting much traction, as we were in East Hampton. Yeah. So that's the sort of the best route we decided to go down. That's fine. I just happened to bump into mayor today and we're just talking about stuff. Excellent. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thanks. Well, be it past six thirty, I'm gonna move back to the public hearing on the cable contract for charter communication. Uh, as the board knows, this contract negotiation's been going on now for almost a year. It's been finalized. We're ready for signature by vote of the board. Uh, to give you just a quick overview, the town would receive about $50,000 in a grant upon the uh, co-signing of this to enhance our cable access channel so we have better viewing. We will also be increasing our revenue from 1% to 3% which will allow us to have more staff time to do more programs and stuff. We will also be in a position of having a live feed from the upstairs of this building, from the library, and from the school, which means hopefully by May town meeting, we should be able to broadcast live at town meeting at the North School which will take and open up avenues for the school department to take and have more programs and stuff in town, as well as the library. And so I see all win-win situations here. It is a 10-year contract. The payment will be once a year 
to the town for the first five years, and then it's going to go to quarterly payments. The uh, charter will be paying us quarterly on the amount of revenue that they owe us on this. And our percentage in five years is going to jump from 3 to 4 percent. So that will increase the amount of money coming in to have better broadcast. And finally, um, this should help us not having to borrow equipment to do what we're doing on so many of these programs and have some actual in-house equipment to move things forward. Um, Kathy, you want to come up and give a quick overview from uh, ECAD? <coughs> sure. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I think that um, overall it's been a pleasure to serve the community of Southampton. It's been really interesting to get to know individuals in this community and I think that we're just beginning now to start some really exciting projects. So having some secured financing, you know, is, is just going to allow community members to let their digital media skills grow. It's going to enable students to be able to use equipment. It's going to be able to, I mean, there are so many possibilities. I don't know where to start. But um, I know that at East Hampton Media, we, um, we're planning on building out a new facility in the next year. And, and then we want to sit down with Southampton and really assess what the needs are and to see, you know, we'd like to collaborate with the town to see where we can put resources in a way that makes the most sense. For the cable contract, I mean, there's, it's very, cable contracts are very limited in what you really can negotiate, and I think that the town did a great job negotiating what, what was offered. So, good job. Also, just to know, we are going to have access to three channels so we could have a government channel, an educational channel, and a sports channel as this builds out over the course of the next five to ten years. So thinking from the future, I think this is a win-win for us. Yeah, sounds good. So I need a motion to accept the contract. Make the motion to accept the contract as written. And I will second that. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Deal. Yay. Don <clears throat> Jacobs. Okay. What, what, what do you want? Drum roll or something? No, I forgot to say the title. <laughs> <laughs> and you're the director of the cable <laughs> company and uh, uh, programs, and you forgot to say who you were. That's good. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, for the record, my name is Don Jacobs. Um, I'm the principal of my consulting company, and I've been doing municipal consulting uh, for 17 years now. And uh, my specialization uh, is on compensation. Uh, I spend probably 90% of my time working with cities and towns, not just here in Massachusetts, but in lots of other places around the country, on the basic fundamental issue of how to manage compensation. Uh, so when Heather uh, first put out an RFP and I responded to that um, RFP. Um, it was clear to me based on what the, the town has in place today in terms of how the town compensates both positions and employees that there really was a need to establish a process enabling the town uh, to really manage compensation in a consistent way and at the same time also what I like to use the term equitable and by that I mean competitive manner as well. Um, I believe you've gotten a packet from uh, the town administrator and what I want to just quickly <coughs> do tonight, my, my purpose of being here really is to share with you now the study that's been completed uh, in terms of the process that's been followed and ultimately what will come back to you in the way of a classification compensation plan for your review and approval. Um, if you look at, and if you have you know, the PowerPoint handout. Uh, the goal, the purpose of having really a compensation plan and the purpose of this study was to conduct what I refer to as a market study. Uh, and so one of the first points I want to make very clear, this was not a cost of living study. The purpose of this study was really to develop a classification compensation plan that really basically enables the town to pay both positions and employees based on market equity conditions. 
um, but not based on cost of living. And sometimes there's a misunderstanding with respect to when we talk about compensation, it's typically referred to oftentimes as cost of living, uh, when in reality it's really not. Um, and of course, making the distinction between paying positions and paying employees is particularly important here in Southampton because if you look at your current plan, right now there is no distinction between how you pay a position and how you pay an employee. They're one and the same thing, which basically puts both the town and the employees at a significant disadvantage with respect to managing compensation consistently, let alone also competitively. Um, and so therefore, when we look at compensation, we want to look at compensation as it relates to positions of employees, both internally as well as externally. So the three objectives that you see listed on the, on the first page are the three specific <coughs> tasks or items that have now been accomplished. Um, and by accomplishing and completing these tasks, the objective is to obviously meet the goal statement of paying positions and employees consistently and also paying them um, equitably. So job descriptions have been written uh, in an accurate way. And as I point out here, accurate really means two things. Establishing uh, what an employee is required to do, uh, but at the same time also establishing uh, the required minimum qualifications or the knowledge, the skill, and ability required to carry out those job duties. And they've all been written in a consistent manner, the same format, and they now contain enough information that has enabled us to accomplish the second objective, which is then to develop a classification plan based on how the job descriptions have been written. And again, the job descriptions really basically describe not just the job duties or essential functions, but most importantly, the knowledge and skill and ability that's required to carry out those job duties. And that's the basis upon which positions have been compared to one another um, and in, by doing so, developing a classification plan, which I'll get to in a minute. So once the classification plan was developed, um, we then conducted a market survey on a position by position basis. And we've surveyed the marketplace, which again, I'll get to in a minute, uh, as far as uh, the details of that uh, market study are concerned. Um, but I think it's important to share with you the process that we've followed in conducting the market study has been based on both demographic as well as operational criteria on a position by position basis, not just demographic criteria. Uh, for example, per capita income or population would be typical demographic criteria. We've used those, but we've placed a great deal more emphasis on operational criteria, basically for the simple reason to try to compare apples to apples, a position uh, in Southampton to a position in the marketplace that from an operational standpoint is comparable in addition to the demographic um, similarities that might exist. So these three objectives have now been completed. Um, if you look at the next page, um, so as a result of updating and writing accurate job because we've now developed a classification plan. Um, and we're recommending that a classification plan be established consisting of six grade levels. Um, just so you understand, the reason why the word regular non-union is, is on this paper, the word regular basically means as distinct from temporary positions. So I think it's important for the board to understand when we talk about compensation this evening, we're talking about compensation as it relates to regular positions. And by definition, regular means um, an employee that's required to work 52 weeks a year. Whereas temporary, by definition, would mean an employee is required to work when you require them to work. You pay them when you require them to work. And that's typically the term that's applied to um, the word temporary. So we're talking about regular positions, whether they're regular full-time or regular part-time, they meet the standard of being required to work 52 weeks a year. Um, and as I mentioned before, the town does not have a classification plan at the present time. And so as a result, frankly, usually the most significant change that occurs when you implement a plan of this type is just that, is the classification plan. And understanding how that's been done so that the town is able to maintain um, both the classification and compensation plan going forward. Um, the next chart simply shows you the communities that, we've been, that have been surveyed. Um, and again, the purpose of the survey was to collect enough market data so that we could have a sense of what is going on in the marketplace. Not based on cost of living, but again, based on what the salaries are being paid. And we only surveyed salaries, by the way, no other element of compensation. Um, You'll see in a minute the compensation plan that's been developed um, is now, in my opinion, competitive with the marketplace. In other words, when you look at the salary ranges, 
that you'll see in the proposed plan, those ranges, the minimum and the maximum um, steps of each of the plans are in fact competitive with the marketplace on a position by position basis. So these percentages that you see here are simply looking at the overall plan and comparing the proposed minimums to the survey average minimums and as well the midpoints and the maximums. So in developing a range structure, what we have in mind is mm -hmm. developing a range structure that's wide enough so that you don't necessarily have to adjust the ranges every single year. In other words, the idea being to let the marketplace um, catch up to your range structure. And when you do need to adjust the ranges, those ranges are adjusted when you feel the ranges are no longer competitive. And so by doing it that way, uh, it enables the town, frankly, to develop a process to maintain the salary range ranges in a competitive manner. Um, if you look at page five in the handouts, um, the process that, we've, that, we're, that we are recommending to um, develop the salary ranges is really based on collecting market data and specifically the average midpoint of the market salary data that you'll see in a, in a subsequent chart and using that data on a grade level by grade level basis uh, as a means of developing what we refer to as a benchmark salary, which is nothing more than a guide. It doesn't mean that's what an employee is paid, but the benchmark salary you'll see in a subsequent chart comes directly from the market data and specifically the average midpoint, ruling out the highs and the lows of the market data and focusing on the midpoint of the data we collect and then using that data as a guide to help us define the word competitive. Okay, so using market data in a manner uh, that we focus on the midpoint of the data we collect for positions in each grade level and then using that benchmark number um, as a basis then to develop a minimum and a maximum for each salary range that's linked to the benchmark market salary number. So very simply by doing it this way, when you collect new market data in subsequent years, the net effect is to adjust the benchmark which in turn will adjust the minimum and the maximum of each respective salary range consistent with whatever's going on in the marketplace. And hence, you know, I think it's fair to say that the range structure that we're recommending to you is quote unquote market driven. It's not cost of living driven, it's market driven. And by doing that, at least then that gives you a structure, um, both grade levels and salary ranges uh, that you should be able to maintain um, on an ongoing manner and address whatever issues that you may need to address as it relates to compensation. Um, the other point I just wanted to make here was simply that, you know, when we talk about, or when we use the term competitiveness, we're really talking about competitiveness that's defined by three criteria. Um, the first one, as I've already mentioned, is how the market data relates to um, your compensation plan. The second one is the actual salary of the employee and how the employee's current salary relates to the benchmark within each salary range. And then the third one is based on how long an employee has been in their respective positions. So in effect, what you wind up having are three criteria that you can use to help you define the word competitive, both in terms of how you pay a position as well as how you pay an employee. Competitiveness with the marketplace, competitiveness with the employee's salary and how that relates to the market data, and then thirdly, how long the employee has been in their respective position. And by doing so, uh, again, you meet the standard of doing this consistently, uh, but I think also you, you, you enable the town to establish an ongoing process that everyone understands, and therefore you're able to maintain going forward so that you don't have to go through this type of study again, um, at least for the foreseeable future. Um, once the plan has been reviewed and approved uh, by the board, then as I point out on the last page of the handout, uh, the next step really is to develop a process to pay employees within the grade level and salary range structure. So in effect, when you do a study like this, one of the time, oftentimes there's a misunderstanding when people hear the word or see the word compensation and they think, well, it's going to cost us a lot of money or it's going to cost us money, when in effect, adopting the plan that's going to be presented to you, buying in itself doesn't cost you any money. Because what's going to be presented to you is a grade level structure, and as I've mentioned, initially right now there are six grade levels, and a respective salary range for each of those six grade levels. That's the structure. That buying in itself doesn't cost you any money. Within that structure then, where the cost obviously comes into play, is when we talk about paying an employee, both to hire an employee 
as well as to retain them. But that's a separate issue, distinct and separate from what in effect is really paying a position initially and then paying the employee secondly. Okay, and I just want to make that point as clear as I, as I can so that you understand um, by approving the plan, buying in itself, it's not obligating the town to spend any money. The obligation to spend the money obviously comes when you hire a new employee and obviously when you spend money to retain them. Um, the next part of your handout uh, is entitled Characteristic Chart. Um, if you look through this at your leisure, or maybe you've had a chance to see it up before tonight, um, this is my simple way of sharing with you what we mean by six grade levels. And what I refer to as the characteristics, or another phrase to use would be the minimum qualifications that defines each of the six grade levels. And as you can see, I've underlined what I think is the most important characteristic that in effect defines each grade level. And if you quickly run through it, when you start at grade level one and you see direct supervision being underlined, what we mean by direct supervision are the job duties are clear, they're detailed, they're very specific. Um, and as a result, it's really viewed as basically an entry level, a minimum level of responsibility or independence. And what we would typically recognize as an entry level um, grade level. The second grade level, you see general supervision underlined as distinct from direct supervision. General supervision means when you look at the job duties of a position in grade level two, they're all governed by an established policy, a procedure, a rule, or a regulation. And it's the responsibility of the employee to carry out a job duty consistent with those rules and regulations and to know which law, which rule, which policy applies to a specific job duty. But the key aspect or um, explanation for a position at grade level two as far as the level of responsibility uh, is that all the job duties are governed by rules and regulations. A little bit more independent, broader range of responsibility than a position at grade level one, but if they're asked to do something that's not governed by a rule or regulation in a grade level two position, then they're required to check with their supervisor before carrying out the job duty. Uh, grade level three is the same general supervision, but a little bit more responsibility, a little bit more, therefore, knowledge and or minimum experience required for a position at grade level three, but the same basic level of independence. So not a whole lot of difference, frankly, between grade levels two and three, other than a little bit more knowledge and or minimum experience required to carry out um, a little bit more complex scope of um, job duties or responsibilities. Grade level four, the key phrase being general, dire general direction, and for the first time you see uh, positions being required to have some level of supervisory responsibility. So grade levels one, two, and three, no supervisory responsibility in any of those first three grade levels. And the general direction um, statement or characteristic in the grade level four, unlike general supervision means you may be asked to do something that's not governed by a rule or regulation or a law, and therefore you have to examine, analyze, evaluate in order to determine what to do. Grade level five and grade level six are your administrative managerial positions. Those are your department heads. And all we're saying here is the difference between grade level five and grade level six, grade level six are your so-called major department heads, your most complex departments. Um, and therefore they have more complexity associated with being a department head, although they both have managerial level of, of supervisory responsibility, grade level six is more complex. Usually what you'd see in grade level six would be positions uh, like a police chief, fire chief, um, public works director type of position, or even the town administrator position. So with those characteristics in mind, that's the first thing we did, was once we'd written job descriptions, we then developed what, are, what you now see are six grade levels. And once we had the characteristics defined for the six grade levels, we then went back and reviewed the job descriptions themselves, and what you see in the next chart is what we're recommending how we're recommending positions to be assigned to one of those six grade levels. So very simply, if you have a question as to why you see a position at one grade level, not another, the first thing you should do is go back and look at the characteristic chart. And that'll give you a basic, simple explanation as to why positions are at one grade level and not another. Okay? Uh, I think the key thing to mention, and again, you don't have a classification plan right now, so this is new. This is different. Um, it's one of the reasons why, frankly, at staff meeting tomorrow and then going forward, we want to give the employees enough opportunity to understand this part of the process so that they can therefore, if they have any concerns, express those concerns 
before the board is actually asked to approve a final plan. Um, if you jump ahead, what's also in your packet is a chart that I want to bring to your attention that really is entitled Proposed Salary Range to Fiscal 17 Survey Data. So it's a one-page document that hopefully is in your packet. And the title of the chart at the top says Proposed Salary Ranges to Fiscal 2017 Survey Data. And it should be hopefully in your packet. I'm looking. And I'm talking these, right? Yeah, those are the salary survey right. charts. Yeah, I'll see it. And there's this and this. Is it one of these? This is all I have right here. Yeah, it doesn't look like it didn't <laughs> make it into the package. Um, we'll get this to you. I'm sorry. I apologize for the confusion. Um, what is in your packet? <laughs> What you can see there is the actual salary survey that was conducted. Right. Um, and there's a summary chart and a detailed chart behind it. The, um, and I mentioned earlier the communities that we actually surveyed. Once we had collected that salary data, as I mentioned in the earlier uh, slide or PowerPoint um, chart, um, we then grouped the market data by grade level. And so for each grade level, we took the midpoint, as I said before, and use the average midpoint as a basis to establish a benchmark. And then from the benchmark, we then established a minimum and a maximum. And I think you have this chart in your packet that sort of summarizes that for you. Yep. So this is my way of sharing with you. If you look right in the middle of this chart, you see benchmark. So if you look at grade level one and you see the $16.94 number in grade level one, that's $16.94 when you do see the other chart is the average midpoint of the survey data for positions in grade level one. Just as grade level two, same thing, that $17.79 is the average of the survey data we collected for positions in grade level two. And so on, right on up through the grade level structure. What's kind of interesting when you look at this chart, um, we're not making these numbers up. Those are actual market data numbers. So all we've done is average the midpoint data we collected for positions in each grade level and put it down on paper. And what you can see there is a natural progression from grade level one all the way up to grade level um, six. Okay? Um, and, and that's the market data telling you that, at least in my opinion, uh, the grade level structure at least is consistent with the market data. In other words, the higher the level of responsibility, the higher the level of complexity, the higher the benchmark. And as I said, all we've done is taken the benchmark and a percentage of the benchmark to be the minimum, and we've multiplied the minimum by a percentage to give us a maximum. And we've done it the same way for each of the ranges. So that structure by itself, again, as I said before, it does not cost you any money. They're strictly guide numbers to help us establish a consistent way to hire new employees and then a consistent way to retain employees, what I refer to as a hiring pay band and what I call a market equity pay band. So if these numbers are competitive at the marketplace, then you should be able to, let's say in grade level one, hire a new employee who meets the minimum qualifications somewhere within that hiring pay band. So the $13.55 to $15.25, that range, that band, is what I'm defining as a hiring pay band. And when you compare that, those two numbers, that minimum and that maximum, 1355 to 15,25, you should be able to hire a new employee who meets the minimum qualifications for a position in grade level one, and then the same principle would apply to grade levels two through six as well. The policies that I'm going to recommend to you that will be in the final report um, will give you the flexibility, frankly. So when you go to hire a new employee, you're not bound by hiring someone just within the hiring pay band. The policy will say, that you have the right to hire, well, the policy is to hire new employees within the hiring pay band with the understanding the town reserves the right to hire above the hiring pay band based on the qualifications of an applicant and also based on market conditions. So you always have the flexibility to hire a new employee at the salary rate that you feel is in the town's best interest. But these numbers, as I said a minute ago, really serve as a guide to help you determine when you go to offer a salary to an employee let alone when you retain an employee, you'll now know whether you're paying that employee competitively or not with the marketplace. So in a sense, the benchmark 
is just that. It's a number that indicates, based on the average market data for your position, if your salary is above or below it, is a very simple way to determine whether you're being paid competitively. Now, unfortunately, you don't have this other chart that would show you all of that. <laughs> um, but I'm sure Bob will get it to you tonight. I think Bob ran out to get yeah, it. Yeah, I think he, <laughs> he ran out to get it for you. Um, what this chart is going to show you, and, and again, I apologize, it wasn't in your packet. Um, you'll see that there will be a column that will show you all the current salaries of the employees that make up this group. There will also be, and then the next three columns will show you the proposed range structure that you see right here on this summary chart. The middle three columns will show you the actual market data that has come from the survey data. So you'll, if you want to know well, where the average minimum come from, you just have to go back and look at the salary charts. The next three columns will show you the proposed range structure to the marketplace, the market data, and it'll show it to you in percentages. So you'll see how these proposed ranges compare to the market data. And then the last column will show you, based on the current employee's salary, whether their salary is above or below the benchmark today. Now the good news is when you look at this chart, and, and you'll see it in, hopefully in a few minutes, um, most of your employee salaries right now are a little bit below the marketplace. You have, you'll see when you go down the list there are some individual employees whose current salaries are significantly below the benchmark. And ultimately the question is going to be before the board is to, based on this proposed plan, well where do we go from here? In other words, now that we've been able to identify there are individuals that are not being paid as competitively as other individual employees, then that becomes a possible criteria for you to use to determine how much of an increase an employee receives going forward. So my objective in working with you right from the get-go <coughs> was really to give you the ability to define that word competitive and then use the competitive criteria as a basis to determine how much of a salary adjustment an employee should receive. Where I'm trying to move you towards is, unfortunately, in the past, we tend to look at salary adjustments as percentage increases, where everyone gets the same percentage increase. That's not equitable. If you really stop and think about it, you know, yeah, it's based on what you can afford, and I understand that. And that's, again, a separate issue. Once you've determined how much you can afford for salary adjustments, what I'm suggesting to you tonight is then the question is, well, how do you want to spend that money? And what the town of Southampton has been doing in the past as I understand it, is that you've been giving people across the board percentage increases, 1%, 2%, whatever it's been. I'm suggesting to you tonight that that should never happen again. That by in itself is not equitable because it really doesn't get at the heart of the issue of paying an employee and trying to pay them competitively. So that what I'm suggesting to you this evening is that dollars and cents should be the driving factor in determining how much of an increase an employee receives. And whether or not that today they're being paid competitively or not, as long as you've defined the word competitive in a consistent way so everyone is being treated the same way, you can use competitiveness as a very valid criteria um, to determine whether or not or how much of an increase someone should receive. And of course, it's always give, governed by what you can afford. And that's really a separate issue, just like any other line item in your budget. Once you've determined how much of a pool of money, let's say, you can afford for salary adjustment purposes, then I'm suggesting to you then to establish a consistent way of spending that money and taking into consideration whether or not an individual employee today is being paid competitively or not, I think is a very valid, very legitimate criteria to use. You don't have to do that. If you want to continue to pay people the same percentage increase or you want to develop any other way of spending the money, obviously that's a discussion that you know, I would welcome having with you or the board um, once you've approved the structure. So the structure, meaning the grade levels and ranges, becomes the, the foundation of your personnel compensation system. Once that's in place, and as I've already suggested, there is a process established to maintain it based on market data and based on changes in duties and responsibilities if you reclassify or you hire a new position and assign a position to a grade level, then the question becomes one of, you know, how do you pay the employee? both to hire them as well as to retain them. And all I'm suggesting is that unlike in the past when you've given everyone the same percentage increase, all I'm suggesting is convert that percentage to a dollar amount. So very simply from an equity standpoint, the lower the salary, if we both get a thousand dollar increase, if my salary is less than yours, I get a greater percentage based salary increase, which I think is more equitable. 
Um, and so just give that some thought. But for now, the main issue before you is um, once we've had feedback from the employees, and we'll meet with department heads tomorrow morning and show them this proposed plan, give them an opportunity to react to it, and I'm sure through the town administrator, you'll get some feedback, some comments, good, bad, and different changes, whatever that people might want to make. Um, but then you'll at least have a plan in front of you that hopefully then you see fit to approve. With that grade level and range structure plan in place, then in conjunction with your budget process, then you can determine how much you can afford for salary adjustments and then establish a set of consistent criteria to spend that money. And that's basically the whole, the whole plan. And, and again, if there's one thing that happens all too often, unfortunately, is you spend the time and effort to try to develop a better way to do this, to manage compensation, but you, you don't develop the process to maintain it. And obviously what we're recommending is that you establish a process to maintain the classification compensation plan, primarily through the town administrator, but also your personnel board. Um, and that's basically it. I'm sorry I've run on probably way too long. There's a lot of information I've given you tonight, but I'm also happy to answer any questions you have. Well, one priority is to get that missing sheet of paper to us, because once you go to the department heads and it's released, people are going to be asking us. Right, right. Okay. Uh, just the email it to us, Bob. I not find it. Uh, two, once this is basically collated with all the responses in that, you're coming back to present to us? Yes. And I would like to make sure that we have the Finance Committee and the Personnel Board at that meeting. There are two players in this. And that's going to drive us for the next annual town meeting as to where we're going. Right. I had a chance to be with your Personnel Board on a couple of occasions. The good news is, from my point of view, uh, they're very familiar with the concept of classifying positions. Uh, very, very familiar. They, they have a lot of expertise and background, as I'm sure you probably know. Um, and as I've already said, that's really one of the more fundamental basic changes that we're recommending this evening. Given the knowledge that they have about that process, and again, it's not driven by dollars and cents, it's driven by how you establish the minimum qualifications for each position, i.e. the job description. Um, there's a lot of miscommunication um, involving your job descriptions, you know, amongst your employees today. Um, I didn't mention when I started, I should have. Um, if there's one characteristic, believe it or not, and as I said, I've probably done over 100 of these kinds of studies in all different sized communities. Out here in this part of the state, um, I've just completed a study for Granby. I'm just finishing a study in Wolverham. I've done one in Conway, Shelburne, uh, West Springfield, you know, all different sized communities. What they all share in common, including the town of Southampton, the number one issue, make no mistake about it, is lack of communication. If I heard anything from your employees time and time again, is that they just don't understand how they're being treated with respect to how they're being paid. And that's a basic fundamental issue that, again, I see all the time in every single community I've ever worked in. Um, this process is designed to solve that problem and establish an open line of communication so that everyone, with no exception, should understand and agree to the process. In other words, you can always agree to disagree about the results. No matter what you tell me, I want to be paid more money. That's a given. But the process um, to determine how to pay you more than or less than someone else, that's the key aspect of this whole study. And again, everything that I've run on about and talked way too much tonight about, I will provide you in writing. In other words, I will give you a set of administrative policies that will describe how we've written a job description, how we've conducted a salary survey, let alone develop salary ranges and the classification plan. Every aspect of the study that we've done, I'll give you a set of administrative written, so-called administrative policies that really ultimately I would ask you and through you, the personnel board, to establish and adopt. So you've got a written set of guidelines that everyone can see and everybody should be able to understand. You can always change them. You can always change the way you're doing it, but at least you have a written set of guidelines. And right now you don't have that. All right? That alone will enable you to open up lines of communication. And I can assure you, your employees really welcome this. They really want you, the town, to communicate to them with respect to how you want to pay them. And it's not a question of how much you pay them as much as it is the process to determine how to pay them. Uh, and I didn't mention, too, by the way, uh, Heather had me write descriptions both for the police department, fire department, and also the highway department. Uh, I've had a chance to meet with 
your highway employees. I've done a salary survey for highway positions, which I will provide to you as part of the final report, separate from the general government positions, just so you know. So we've really written job descriptions for every single position in the town. And all the department heads have had input into them. They've all reviewed them. What they haven't seen is what you've seen tonight. And they will see it uh, tomorrow morning. And that way, they'll be able to react to it, particularly the job descriptions. And if they want to make any changes, if they feel something is not consistent with how um, they think a particular position's level of responsibility has been described in the job descriptions, they'll have an opportunity to react to it. Any other questions? Concern? Just, just one quick question. This chart you showed me right here, it has the classifications. Oh, these are these employees here. Uh, the salary, yeah. And those are the responses we got, correct. You have number seven there. I'm just curious. The chart only goes to six. Uh, these are the number of survey responses. Because if you want to know who oh. responded. Oh, these aren't classifications. No, 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 no. Okay, no. I thought you those were classifications. Detail chart. There we go. And okay. it'll tell you by position who responded, which community responded. Okay. So not every community responded to every single position. And that, so that, the first chart is a summary chart. Okay. And then what follows, what's attached to it is the detail chart. Um, and so if you see, you know, if you see salary data, for example, that you're not comfortable with, you know, a particular community has responded for a position and it's just way out of line with all the other market data, you know, by mm -hmm. all means, you don't have to use that data. I don't think that's the case, but, you know, again, how you interpret or how, or how you react to certain data is obviously a very subjective decision. Point being that if you see something you, you're not comfortable with, we can always change it. Right, but the data yep. you see on that chart, though, is what we've actually used to develop the range structure. Okay. Okay. So again, approving the plan by itself does not cost you any money. And I'm only emphasizing that because hopefully when it's all said and done, you will approve a plan and then focus on what you can afford and how to spend that money. That's a separate decision from initially what we're asking you to approve, uh, and that is to approve the classification. And when we say compensation plan, again, what we mean by that are salary ranges. Okay? So again, I, I want to also, I was remiss by not saying at the beginning, uh, your employees have been incredibly cooperative, very supportive. Uh, Heather was, was very supportive, as have all your employees, and I really appreciate that. It's not always the case. Uh, but here they were very, very supportive, and uh, it's been a real pleasure to work with them. They recognize this needs to happen. We all recognize this. They really do, and, and I can't emphasize that enough. They really want you to communicate to them to explain how they're going to be treated with respect to how they're being paid. And hopefully this is a process that you'll be comfortable adopting and then managing going forward. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank Appreciate you, it. Thank you. Okay. I guess we're moving into old business and plowing of private ways. I'll give a quick overview. This topic seems to be coming up on again, off again. I We've done some research. This goes back to 1986. Uh, so it's a long-standing issue in this town. Basically, there's a general law, and I will read the law so everyone at home can hear what it says. Uh, chapter 40, Section 6C, Removal of Ice and Snow from Private Ways, Conditions, a city or town which accepts this section in the manner provided in Section 6D may appropriate money for the removal of snow and ice for such private ways within its limits and open to the public use as may be designated by City Council Selectmen, provided that the purpose of this Section 25, Chapter 84, the removal of snow and ice for such a way shall not constitute a repair of the way. In other words, this is a safety issue. If these roads need to be opened up and they're private and we see that this, no one's doing it, we can do this. What we need to do is put this as an article for town meeting and let the voters decide if we want to do this on private ways. And if they do, then it's up to this board to designate what streets or roadways we think this is necessary. We have quite a list of roads in this town that we have been plowing for years. Mm -hmm. 
the newer developments and stuff we don't do, but there's been a past history of us dealing with a number of private roads only because the roads were never accepted and there's no mechanism to realistically accept them because they're either too small or not built properly, so on and so forth. So the way to get this to some resolution is to bring it as an article for town meeting. Do I hear a motion to put this on for our next special town meeting? Yeah, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. But I got a question. Uh, yeah. What do we do about the roads we're plowing prior if the snow storms before the... I believe that we should continue mm -hmm. plowing the roads that we are plowing until this town meeting and until the select board has a chance to reassess. My feeling would be just me myself that this reassessment would take effect in the spring after the weather clears. I would never want to take and just yank plowing the roads in the middle of winter on somebody. The other thing that uh, I'm sure that will come up at town meeting, they're going to want to know like what streets. You have a list of streets that we're talking about? Well, I have a... We, we may want to have that available for the meeting. I, I'm going to have Mr. Kemp, Randall Kemp, the highway superintendent, have that available. I'm not going to even try to. I took a tour with him a number of months ago on all these streets. And it took a half a day because there are all these little dead-end streets here, there, and everywhere else. Virginia appear to be perplexed. Uh, there's roads like Wallace Road and stuff like that. The cottage, I think, cottage is. Cottage is another one. That, yeah. They're all small streets that were been there for the last hundred years or so, and they evolved from being a horse path to being a dirt road to being sort of a common type situation. And way before Ed Colley was hired, John Garska and them used to plow them out, and it was a courtesy, and it's what communities used to do. That's the history of it. In fact, there's a reverse side of it, too. We sometimes plow up Valley Road because the town didn't get there, and we can get there with the machines. So I guess we're going to have to petition the town to authorize us to open a road when we want to. Anyways, have had a little fun with that. <laughs> uh, let's see. Approval of payroll? Was there a payroll? Uh, I, I don't have one. Um. Well, there's another document, payroll and bill warrants, uh, warrant W17-19 for November 10th, 2016, in the amount of $1,407,508.65 uh, that was approved by myself on November 8th on behalf of the select board. So basically I'm reporting that out to you guys. Um, okay. There is no other payroll. Um, we have a personnel change form for approval of payout to Heather, our town administrator. Did I hear him? Chairman, um, just to make sure that you have the correct number of hours, uh, the report that you received first. I believe said that uh, it was 99 hours. Uh, the <clears throat> uh, town accountant came in with a correct, uh, I, I guess, I don't know how they got to 99, maybe Heather estimated 99, but the correct number is 98.5 hours payout. Adjust the, the 98.5 hours. At $28.01. $28.01. Total was twenty seven fifty eight ninety eight. Do I hear a motion to move this? So yeah, can you exp this is again what? A Basically Heather left. When Heather left she had vacation time that we're obligated to pay her. That's what that's all about. And we've done this historically with all oh, town employees. Paying the following years. Right. Vacation. This yep. is what I heard. So this is the balance of this year. Right. Like the next year's vacation, they get paid yeah. out when they leave. Yeah, because we they start this off. July 1. Yeah. Oh, I see. Because this is good to June 30th, is what you're saying? Mm-hmm. need a motion. Uh, 
I'll make a motion. Second. Any more discussion? You want details? I mean, I'll make a motion. You said it's two thousand seven hundred and fifty-eight dollars and ninety-eight cents. Yes. Okay, yeah, buy out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just wanted to clarify that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. All right. And we did that. We did that. Our next select board meeting is December 6th. Mm -hmm. And the one after that's the 20th. Mm -hmm. uh, I see minutes here for a regular meeting for November 15th, 2016. Has anybody had an opportunity to review those? I have not. I have not either. All right, then we'll take that. There's just one minor change I'll make, but that's All right, we'll deal. table for next meeting. In, oh, uh, the Class Two motor vehicle license for 75 Pequot Road. Has that check come in? The, no, it is not. All right, so signature awaiting Correct. the check. Correct. Mr. Administrator, is there anything else in open session? <coughs> So there's no payroll this week. Uh, I didn't request receive that? one. That's no. Okay. What'll probably happen is I'll get a call tomorrow to come sign it. Okay. Because it's, it's usually on Wednesdays. So this was uh, on a meeting that I was not here. We had talked about having one person sign off on the paperwork on behalf of the select board. Mm -hmm. So sure. I thought that was on certain contracts that we've discussed. So it's on the all the warrants and the payrolls. There's only one person who signs off on that, so not everyone has to come in to look at it? That's correct. The way we voted was, and this is a new state law that was effective November 7th, if memory serves, we authorized the chair or the vice chair to sign off on warrants and payrolls mm -hmm. so that the board didn't have to come in, but that individual had to report at the meeting what they signed. That's why you heard me read that mm -hmm. amount of money. Uh, it does not preclude you from going in and reviewing everything. But out of the necessity of moving the bills forward and stuff, it was extremely difficult to get three board members to <coughs> come in and sign, and that's been going on statewide. It's not just Southampton. Mm -hmm. That's the reason they changed the law. And just a formality, once you report to us, should we vote to accept that number, or that's not required? Mm -hmm. That's done. It's already done. It's done. Okay, yeah. just asking. Yeah. Now, as for contracts, I will ask the board on issues like the conservation agent mm -hmm. that if we review this and conservation is in favor of it and they got a timeline, am I authorized to sign it for the board? Mm -hmm. And you guys have voted to authorize me on a number of different contracts to sign it only because we knew that our meeting right. wasn't going to be until the deadline had come and gone. But as you saw tonight with Charter Cable, mm -hmm. it was brought as a second hearing in front of the board right. for signature. Even though I've been burying you with emails showing you the updates and stuff mm -hmm. like that, we did not go with, we're just going to have the chair sign this. Right. Uh, you will find the only time I'll ask you is if I see a time frame problem. Mm -hmm. Other than that, it'll come in front of the board. So. Now that you sign all of the warrants and the payroll, we don't really know when they're done. I don't get any kind of notification saying that they're ready. It used to be come in and come sign them. Now we don't know because you come in and sign them. That's and right, I, and I was one me. who sat there and combed through everything to see where the money was going and what was being spent. Well, how do you, we how had found quite a few things, or I did a while back, and bills that weren't being paid and all that. So now. I'm not getting notified of when these bills are done so I can even come in and go through them. When I get notified that they're ready for signature, I have no problem sending out another text. Texts are probably easier mm -hmm. to all of us and tell you they're there. Because I know Jim was another one who combed through them. You want to do that? I tend to go through it, but that's fine, yeah. I have no problem with that. Yeah, if you send, a, send an email out, they're ready, and yeah. if anybody wants to take a look at it. Sure. That sounds reasonable. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's ending up being me because John's not around in the daytime. So, in fact, I think I suggested that you be one of the co-signatures, and that didn't go anywhere. 
but it doesn't uh, matter. And I'm only pushing because I wasn't at that meeting when you guys had voted that. I'm only a junior member. <laughs> First year. <laughs> okay. Barbara, so, is there anything you would like to address the board with? No. I'm okay. I'm happy. <laughs> we're going to be moving into executive session unless there's something else. Well, I want to thank everybody. We're going to move into executive session. We will not be coming out to public. Uh, so I need a roll call vote under Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21, Item 2, uh, Negotiation Non-Union Personnel, Item 3, to discuss strategy respective connective bargaining. Do I uh, hear a motion? Motion. <laughs> Cutler eye. <laughs> Libri eye. Kaneki eye. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>